Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on the topic of coping effectively with anger in your relationships. My name is Ann Lee Gilbert, and I'm the Director of Programs for Can Do Multiple Sclerosis, and I'm excited to be your moderator this evening. For those of you who are new to Can Do MS, we are a provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people who are living with MS and for their support partners. And through our programs, we empower people to manage their disease and to move beyond their MS by adopting active and healthy lifestyle behaviors. And you can learn about all of our different programs by visiting our website at www.mscando.org backslash programs. Um, and just an overview, we have um, a few in-person programs. Uh, we have our four-day flagship program called the Can Do Program that's done once a year in Denver. We have our one-day program called Jumpstart, and that's done four to five times a year in different parts of the country. And then we have our two-and-a-half-day program called Take Charge, and that's done twice a year. And then, of course, we have our webinar series. So please, please uh, come visit our website to learn about all of these programs and whether or not we'll be in your area. You can also uh, connect with us on social media. Find us on Facebook, like us, and you'll get all kinds of up-to-date information regarding our upcoming programs and events. And we're also on YouTube, um, so look for us on YouTube and you'll be able to browse some fun videos um, and old webinar archives and recordings, so please be sure to look for us on social media. And so I'd, I'd now like to introduce our presenters for the evening. On the screen here, you'll see Peggy Crawford. Peggy Crawford is a health psychologist and a CAN-DO MS programs consultant. Dr. Crawford's training and clinical experience as a health psychologist for more than 20 years have afforded her the unique opportunity to work with and learn from individuals and families living with MS. She's had the privilege to share in the life stories that define the journey over the course of MS and reflected these stories into presentations, research projects, and publications. The courage that men and women with MS display when facing difficult challenges has been an inspiration in Dr. Crawford's work and in her personal life. As a former staff member at the MS Center at the Cleveland Clinic, and most recently the Department of Neurology at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center, she has had the opportunity to reconnect or to connect with professionals as well as individuals with MS and their families. These relationships have nourished her passion for working in the field of chronic illness, just as time in, Mar in Maine has nourished her soul. And our second presenter for the evening is Sue Kushner. Sue Kushner has been a physical therapist for 28 years. She graduated from the University of Pittsburgh undergrad and TT school at Columbia University. She is currently finishing her PhD in exercise physiology at the University of Pittsburgh. Sue has been with the Can Do MS program for 23 years. She's been on the faculty at Slippery Rock University for 21 years in the Graduate School of Physical Therapy. She works clinically doing home care PT. Sue has also volunteered with the National MS Society for 22 years, both at the local and national level. This includes committee work, volunteer speaking, treating patients, writing, and editing. In 2006, Sue was awarded Volunteer of the Year by the National MS Society. She's on the editorial board for Momentum Magazine, the client publication of the National And before I turn it over to uh, Peggy and Sue, we did, have, um, we did want to start off the presentation with a polling question. So on your screen, uh, you should see a polling question. And that question is, in the past month, how often would you say you felt really angry? So again, in the past month, how often did you feel really angry? So if you can go ahead and make your selection, either none, a few times in the month, a few times a week, or every day, um, just go ahead and make that selection and hit Submit. And you'll also be able to see uh, the results of your uh, fellow participants of this web webinar. Um, and as I'm looking at responses that are coming in, it looks like a majority of people, 62%, have um, felt really angry a few times um, in the past month. I have about 20% a few times a week. I have happy following of none, of people who are not getting angry at all, at 10% and um, about 9% who are getting angry every day. So we have a good mix here, but again, it, it looks like um, the majority is get, uh, gets angry a few times in the past month. So now I'd like to uh, turn it over to Peggy. Thanks, Anne, and it's great to be here with everyone tonight and with my partner, Sue. 
Um, I just want to say about the survey, I think we have a lot of incredibly honest people out there who are acknowledging um, anger, which is really pretty normal. I, I think we might want to uh, find out from those people who, who aren't getting angry what their secret is or what they're doing. <laughs> um, we often like to provide an example. So we've pulled together kind of a composite person who is Alice, and um, she has MS, and we use an example of somebody who's dealing with the issues on which we're presenting and that's anger. So Alice is 50. She was diagnosed with MS after the birth of her second child, who's 15. So she's had MS for 15 years. She's married. She also has a 17-year-old, two daughters, by the way. Um, she's noticed increased symptoms really over the past year or two, and she primarily has fatigue, leg stiffness, memory problems, so in large part symptoms that are, are really kind of invisible. Um, she did cut back at work to half time about nine months ago, but really hasn't noticed that that's made much of a difference. And she resents her children for not helping, and she resents her husband's comments about things not getting done, even though she's home half time, and the limited finances since she reduced her work hours. She feels irritable, discouraged, and guilty, and I bet if we asked her family to describe her mood, they would say, Mom is just really moody and kind of mad all the time. Arguments are more frequent. There is less time together as a family and a couple. And Alice, like many of you, I'm sure, receives lots of unsolicited advice about her MS, including the need for regular exercise, for which she really feels she has no time or energy. We have another polling question for all of you. And this one is about um, mood. And the question is irritability, impatience, and having short temper, that should say, um, can be symptoms of depression, especially in MS. Options are true or false. So if everyone could make a selection. Well, it's looking like almost 97, 98% of people, down a little bit, 96% of people um, know that irritability and patience and um, having a short fuse, short temper, can be symptoms of depression. This is true for all people, but it's especially the case in MS. There just seems to be an irritability to mood, a fluctuation mood, up and down, um, uh, mood swings, that kind of thing, incredibly common in MS, and we're still really trying to understand why that is. So a well-informed group we have here. So we want to talk a little bit about what anger is and can be, because it's kind of a mixed bag. You know, it's incredibly common, as you saw in your own polling question, unavoidable, inevitable, and expressed in multiple ways, certainly with words, facial expression, behavior, slammed doors, um, disgruntled harumphs, whatever. Um, it's a normal human emotion. Um, but here's where the mixed bag comes in. It can be an absolute energy drain. It takes energy to be pissed off. Sometimes people use it as a rationale. You might say an excuse for inappropriate behavior. Well, I was mad when I did it. I was mad when I said that. I didn't mean it. It can really be a cover for other feelings. So often behind anger, if people can kind of peel the way to, away the layers like an onion, people are experiencing fear, anxiety, but what they express is anger. It can also, as we said, be a symptom of depression for both people with MS and other people in your life who don't have MS. It's also a signal. It's kind of like a fever. It tells you something's going on. It's a signal that things are really out of balance. And for many people, experiencing anger, particularly recurrent anger that's really getting in the way, can be fuel for productive change. So it can be motivating. We're going to talk some tonight about the impact of anger on individuals, but also on relationships, and then give you some ideas about how to make changes and what would be a more adaptive way to uh, deal with that. So 
part of what happens and the reason that people often come to see me as a psychologist when they have more anger problems is that it increases stress. So they get into a vicious cycle where they get stressed, they get angry, they get angry, they feel more stressed. Sometimes people cope with anger in ineffective and unhealthy ways. Maybe they drink too much, they take more prescription medication, they shop online, uh, they eat, they spend less time at home or too much of their time at home. It also disrupts sleep um, tremendously because people tend to lay awake at night replaying arguments and set twos over and over. Often when people are angry, they experience more guilt and lower self-esteem, and this can get them into mood down as well. And over time, people can have a sense of being trapped and hopeless, feeling alone and isolated, and you can see how some of these, the, the impact of anger really is very consistent then also with depression. And if you have a health condition like MS, often what people experience is that their symptoms, their MS symptoms, actually increase in intensity. And this may be part of what's going on with Alice, that with stress and anger, her leg stiffness and her fatigue are actually experienced as fear. We are looking for your input again. We have another polling question. This one is about exercise and mood. Exercise can help to combat depression and or anger. Options are true or false. Boy, you are right on the stick here tonight. Again, I would say an incredibly well-informed audience that we have tonight. So almost 100% of you. Um, are aware that exercise can help with mood. Sue, what are your thoughts on our poll results? Well, again, as Peggy said, it is a very well-informed group um, for issues of anger and exercise. Um, and we do appreciate your honesty, especially where the anger is concerned. And um, we should have said with the anger issues that um, Let's keep the weather that is nationwide, rain and floods and tornadoes everywhere, out of the issue because that, that makes us all not happy this summer. Um, but I do want to focus on the impact of exercise related to anger and uh, in general related to MS and how the body functions. Um, let me first go through the impact of exercise. I think most everybody knows these days the wonderful, um, the endless physiological benefits related to exercise um, on every major system of the body. The heart, which is a muscle, the strength in your muscles. Um, exercise helps uh, keep bones strong. It helps digestion, helps decrease uh, GI problems. And it is wonderful for the mind. The psychological and emotional benefits are well, well established in, in, in uh, countless um, clinical studies. Um, it can also help improve or maintain um, strength and balance and coordination and uh, increases flexibility, which can help folks maximize movement and their functional activities. So basically, Exercise is a must-do feature of your life with or without MS. So I want to mention that, too, to support partners that are out there. Um, you know, everybody should be doing what they can to the best of their abilities to keep moving. Um, and like I mentioned before, the psychological benefits are as important, if not more so, than the physiological or the physical benefits. It, uh, exercise can really help control anger issues. It's been shown that it helps mood, uh, helps combat depression and frustration. Exercise is also classified as a medication or a prescription. Many physicians will say, you know, here's your medication or here's the disease-modifying therapy that you should be on or uh, we're going to set you up for a baclofen pump and also see your physical therapist or whoever you see for a prescription for exercise. Um, we as 
healthcare professionals, particularly myself as a physical therapist, we can um, help you fine-tune a program that is specific for you. I think everybody knows how wide and far the signs and symptoms of MS can be. So not every activity or exercise prescription is going to work for every particular individual. Um, the disease is so varied that the exercises and activities that are going to be recommended for each individual are going to be as widely recommended. Um, exercise can also be a fantastic socialization for folks with MS and their support partners. I don't know how many of you go out of the house to exercise, but it's a wonderful um, you know, atmosphere when you walk into a place that, oh, hi, how are you? How was your weekend? Or, oh, gosh, you weren't here last week. Were you on vacation? A lot of people get energy from exercising in a social atmosphere. Then, of course, other folks like to you know, prefer to exercise in the privacy of their own home with a big T-shirt on and pop a video in and go down to their game room where nobody will see them and they don't have to talk to anybody. But in general, exercise and activities, which I like to lump into the category of exercise, can be very, very social. A lot of people use this to, to gain closeness with their support partner, to keep up with friends, to um, really augment a vacation. You know, if you're out somewhere and you, you, um, you know, go skiing in the winter or like to hike or walk um, certain times of the year, of the year um, it's, a, it's a wonderful social outlet. Also, needless to say, exercise assists tremendously with weight control. Um, diet and calorie intake is extremely important. Um, but exercise is a very, very close, close second to that. Um, so we have another polling question. Again, we appreciate your honesty. Do you have a fairly routine exercise program that you do or adhere to regularly, or you know, semi-regularly? So go ahead and answer that. Well, that's pretty good to see. Um, we have over half of the attendees on this conference call um, exercising regularly or semi-regularly. Um, you know, the, the things um, that are really important here is the regularity. And it doesn't matter what you do as long as you are moving. A lot of people will um, think that, well, I, I am not in a regular exercise program, but they don't realize. They, they may walk a quarter or a half a mile each way to work or to the bus stop. They may work hugely in their garden, in their yard, coaching a child's soccer or baseball team, um, doing a lot of housework, or their job may be burning calories and keeping their heart rate up and you know, making it a cardiovascular job each and every day. Um, so again, we cannot um, overemphasize the importance of a regular activity and exercise program. Um, here we just have a little comic that um, hopefully is making you chuckle even though everybody is muted. Um, and then I'm going to turn things over to Peggy again and say and ask her, you know, how can anger impact relationships? Thanks, Sue. You know, I think that uh, cartoon that uh, we just showed everyone where the couple's in the therapist's office, marriage counselor's office, and the woman uh, in the couple is saying, you know, Curly here says I'm sarcastic, um, obviously, and I, I guess, you know, you can see that Curly kind of has a an angry look on his face too, and his arms are folded into his chest, and I, I just want to acknowledge that the cartoons we're using tonight are from a program that we do through the National MS Society called Relationship Matters. Um, and it's a great program, and, and a lot of it's based on how do you manage conflict and communication, um, how do you improve your communication, which we're going to talk about tonight as well. So um, I think you have to give them credit. Uh, Curly and his girl are in the counselor's mm -hmm. office. So, yes. Anger, just as it can affect ind individuals, 
can affect relationships as well. You know, I think people, um, even when they love one another, and there's anger in the picture, and think of our example at the beginning of the program, Alice and her husband um, and her family, daughters. Um, sometimes t with anger, people become opponents rather than working members of the same team. People are really working at odds. Um, anger tends to result in a lot of blaming and finger pointing, finding fault, um, and who wants to have fingers pointed? Fault found, not too many people, so we tend to sort of go the other direction. So people end up spending more time apart than together. Um, people are actually less likely to help each other. So at the very time when families are struggling with MS on the scene and just all of the demands of regular life, um, and everybody needs assistance, this is the time that people are actually less likely to offer help or to like the help that's Also, when people are angry, it's sort of like everything that gets said and done goes through a filter, an anger filter. And so that what got said, whatever was intended, goes through this filter, and when we hear it, when we see it on the person's face, we in fact may miss it and take a different meaning than that they intended. Um, sometimes people act in ways when they're angry, this is actually often the case, that they often regret afterwards but can't take back. This is sometimes behavioral, something that someone did um, purposely to hurt someone's feelings, or it might be something said or something that someone held. Um, sometimes people just withhold themselves and attention from the other person. So clearly, impact can have, um, anger can have an impact on. So we want to talk a little bit about triggers for anger. So we are asking you to respond to yet another question. And this one is, what is most likely to trigger your anger? The options are money issues, work, family issues, something related to MS or other. And I would say, since many of us might choose all of the above, uh, we would like you to choose what seems to be the primary source, or the primary trigger. Hey, Peggy, uh, this is Ann. Um, we've mm -hmm. received a couple of comments that your voice is sounding a little bit low. Um, oh, so, okay. I can try yeah, to talk louder. Yeah, you can try to talk a little bit louder. Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Will do. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> that's okay. Is that helping? It sure does, okay. yes. Okay, terrific. All right, so let me take a look here at the results. Okay, well, we actually have a nice spread. Now, we're not going to know what the other category represents, but we have, gosh, like 43% of people indicating family issues. And MS, something related to MS, about 31%. Money issues, always a popular trigger, always unfortunately a common one. Work for many people. And remember, this can be, we're talking about not just the person with MS here, but anybody in the family or your life could have anger triggered by any of these. And I will tell you that in studies that we've done over the years, the primary trigger um, for anger often is other people, sort of what they do, what they don't do, what they say, that sort of thing. So we can see here that family issues a big trigger for anger. So as we said, money, family, parenting, differences of opinion about any of these things, how to deal with family issues, how to deal with relatives, how to deal with your children. The division of the workload within a family is often a trigger for anger. And here we're talking about for everybody these can be triggers, not specifically for families uh, coping with MS. But when you add MS into the equation, there's a zillion things that people might feel angry about. Right from the very beginning, sometimes people feel angry about the diagnosis. I was always a good person. I took good care of myself. I've never taken any prescription medicines. This isn't fair. Why me? Why us? Why my spouse? Why my girlfriend? 
Um, why has this come into our life? So that's a common trigger. Uh, seeing others do what you can no longer do. And again, I'm not just talking about the person with MS here. But if you and your family always hiked and, and went camping for days at a time, and now that's very difficult for you to do, that is often a common trigger. Exacerbations, when people have a worsening uh, of their symptoms, uh, a new symptom, progression uh, that results in losses of function, losses of responsibility. And again, this changes for everybody in the family. Um, when people are needing to leave a job, leave the workforce much earlier than they really wanted to do, that's a significant loss. And boy, are people mad about that. Sometimes people have mixed feelings about it. That's true. So it can be a relief to get away from a stressful work environment. It can be a relief to have time to uh, take better care of yourself. But it's a significant loss and a source of anger, particularly um, if people feel forced out of a job that they really didn't want to leave. So, and changes in roles and responsibilities at home, at work, when uh, responsibilities are switched to somebody else when you didn't really want to give them up, that's a trigger for anger. And just everyday frustrations um, presented by MS. For example, People often say it's so frustrating that we can't plan ahead. We can't plan a vacation because I never know how I'm going to feel. Or people find that some activity has to be canceled because they're having a bad day. Boy, is that frustrating. And I've certainly interviewed kids who have a parent with MS who say, we can't go anywhere. We can't, we can't uh, take a trip like other families because my mom or my dad is always, is always tired. Um, I think it's frustrating for people when getting ready for work is work, when it feels like you're done for the day and you've only really just started. There are some additional MS-related triggers that I wanted to review. <clears throat> and I said earlier when you did the polling question about triggers for anger that people are high up on the list. And I think sometimes it is people don't help, as Alice, the example that we gave, her daughters don't help, and they're clearly 15 and 17. They're old enough to help, right? So why aren't they helping? So that's frustrating. Or when people help you, but they do it in their way. Sometimes help is just absolutely refused. Sometimes, um, and I'm talking about sometimes the person with MS actually refuses help that's offered. Sometimes the help is taken for granted, like people should just give it um, without a second thought. And sometimes it's not really appreciated. People actually like to be uh, shown appreciation for something that they've done. Uh, people without MS, including family and friends who might love and cherish this person, often just don't get MS. That's a trigger for anger. They don't particularly get the invisible symptoms. They don't understand when you say fatigued that that's different than when they get fatigued. And so I know it's like nails on a chalkboard when people say things like, oh, I know what you mean. I get tired too, or I have problems with my memory, or I can't think of what I want to say. And I think a really big source is that well-intentioned but unwanted advice. And remember I said Alice was getting a lot of advice from people in her life, um, about, particularly about exercise, which she didn't feel that she really could do. I think that when people give this advice, often there is implied criticism and you sort of get the sense that they feel you're not really taking very good care of you. So all of those are MS-related triggers. There are some areas just ripe for conflict um, when MS is on the scene. For example, even at the beginning, after MS is diagnosed, in some families there is disagreement about how to handle the issue of disclosure, who to tell, what to tell, when to tell. I've worked with couples where they know 
but their parents who live in the area don't know or their siblings don't know. I've met with people who haven't told their children who are teenagers about the MS. And sometimes one parent wants to tell and the other one doesn't, so boy, talk about conflict and talk about anger. Sometimes within families there's a difference of opinion about how the MS should be treated. Some people feel that the person with MS should immediately go on a disease-modifying medication, while other people feel you should wait and see, wait till they come out with something better, wait till they come out with something that doesn't have side effects. Um, maybe you'll have a mild case of MS or you'll go into remission. So I've met with couples and families, again, where there is huge difference of opinion. Also, this change um, and possible imbalance in roles and responsibility. Remember what I said about Alice. You know, she's now working half time, and so her husband doesn't understand why more things aren't getting done and makes comments about this. He's feeling overwhelmed. And so sometimes what happens is one person feels they're doing the work of two. Um, I think in most families nowadays, pretty much even without MS, people feel they're doing more than the work of more work than that of one person. There are also um, ripe areas for conflict when it comes to safety for someone with MS. Who gets to decide what is too risky? So, for example, how much physical activity should a person with MS be doing and what kind of activity? Uh, what if a person with MS is driving and they've had a couple of accidents in the past year, even if one of them wasn't their fault? Who gets to make that decision? And if a spouse says, gosh, I'm really concerned about your driving, you know, our insurance rates are up, I'm concerned about your safety, should you be driving the children? And certainly the area of managing finances, if the person with MS has been the person to always balance the checkbook or pay the bills online and some bills aren't getting paid, certainly a spouse, family members are going to be concerned about that. But who really gets to make these decisions and what do you do with that conflict and anger uh, that results? Sue, I mentioned physical activities, but I wonder how do you see conflict associated with exercise? Um, thank you, Peggy. And um, to the audience, yes, I, I do want to um, mention that you may have wondered from the title of the talk, like how can exercise and activity tie in with anger? Well, it does. Like I said, not only did I talk about a, a, a little bit about how exercise can help combat anger and um, depression, but um, exercise can also be an area of conflict for the person with MS and their support partners. Uh, going back to our case study, Alice, um, it is mentioned that she is receiving some unsolicited advice. And um, uh, Peggy had mentioned also that support partners may give well-intentioned advice regarding exercise. And this can be a, a, a real tinderbox for relationships. Um, the person with MS may find that they are pushing themselves too hard. They may think that, well, my physical therapist said, uh, you know, three sets of ten repetitions for this it may help my foot drop, may help my quadricep weakness, may increase my trunk control. So I bet that you know, five or seven sets are really going to help me, and that's not true. Or the person with MS may not be pushing themselves hard enough. They, they may have the woe is me, poor me attitude, um, you know, and just do nothing and, and become the, uh, you know, the uh, proverbial couch potato. The support partner may also do one or the other of these extremes with pushing too hard or not enough. There are support partners who may think that, um, well, darling, I love you, but if you would just work harder, you would still be able to ski with me every winter. You would still be able to walk around New York City with me. That is not the case at all. Um, the disease will take its course to some extent. You can combat that with medications, the disease-modifying therapies, exercise, etc. to use what you have to the best of your ability. 
Now, that is certainly the responsibility of the person with MS. But above and beyond that, that you cannot fault the person with MS, you know, and you cannot uh, think that if they do more, they will prevent the progression of the disease. Or if you would do more, you just would not be in the wheelchair. That is not going to be true. On the other extreme of a support partner's help, and I use help in quotations because sometimes it can be very helpful, sometimes it can be very detrimental. Some folks want to help their beloved with the MS so much and so heartfelt that they end up treating that person like a China doll and not allowing them to do anything, um, taking away their independence, taking away their inability to exercise, and they're actually hindering the person's progress or ability to at least maintain what they have physically. So it is a, you know, it's a really fine line for both the person with MS and the support partner, how much to push, how much to not push. Um, there is a, a areas of conflict with uh, the intensity and how much activity to do. You may have been a five to seven day a week, you know, almost borderline psychotic workout person. Um, certainly you should have at least two days a week off, um, possibly more, and the main thing is to listen to your body. But you may need to scale down that five days a week to three days a week and be satisfied with that. You may um, have been um, you know, an exerciser one hour per day on the days that you exercise. You may need to scale that down to 30 minutes or three bouts during the day of 20 minutes each of activity or exercise. The support partner and the person with MS have to learn to let the person with the MS listen to their body. I cannot emphasize that enough. There are going to be good days and bad days, and again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but I'm preaching a little bit more to the support partners with that sense. Let the person with the MS decide how they are feeling that day or that string of days, and let them decide how much they can push. Now, Certainly the, the support partner, if they're seeing that the person is really fading into a, a state of being a couch potato for no big reason, there's no exacerbation, there's no urinary tract infection, there's, there's really no reason, um, you're, not, you're not seeing huge signs of depression, the, pers the person with MS may just you know, be getting a little lax on their activity then certainly if you can encourage them in a loving, caring way to, hey, come on, do this with me. Let's just go out and do 10 or 20 or 30 minutes of this. Then, you know, I am all for that. But do allow the person with MS to listen to their body because the fluctuations in their physical um, abilities are going to vary tremendously day to day, and that does not even include exacerbation periods and periods of remission. Other areas that may, of exercise that may call, cause conflict are, do we do our activity alone or together? Some folks, you, you, know, they may have, you may have met your support partner in a bike ride, in, you know, on, the, on the chairlift scheme. That may have been your common bond and you would love to continue doing activities with your support partner. That may be possible with modifications. That may not be possible. Uh, what I encourage people to do is give each other some space. You know, if you're able to do maybe adaptive skiing, you can do that with your partner. Otherwise, maybe let your support partner who's still a double black diamond person, you maybe used to be a single black diamond and keep up with him or her, you know, maybe let them go for a long weekend once a year, you know, to their favorite ski resort with their friends. And then, you know, you stay home and do your own thing. Um, other people may always have liked to exercise alone, and now their loved one wants to, you know, help them, support them, carry them through their activities. And the person with MS may be like, 
please just leave me alone. You know, let me do my thing, like I mentioned before, in the game room, in the privacy of my own domain. So those are things that need to be talked about between the two of you or with your children. You know, you may have been a super active family. Everybody skied. The kids were on ski patrol. You had a, a ski condo. And, you know, that may not be what is happening these days. But, again, I encourage, and this would be with um, certainly with a, a psychologist or counselor's input, talk these things out and find what will work the best for you and your loved ones at this period of time. Also an area that may cause conflict, and this is related to the myth that um, you wouldn't be in a wheelchair if you exercised more. More does not always equal better. Um, in fact, uh, it, it usually you know, gets to a tipping point where too much activity, too much exercise can be detrimental. You can find yourself a victim of overuse injuries. You can find yourself becoming bored with the same activity over and over again. Um, so please listen to the healthcare professional that is recommending what you do and how much you do. And let me also put a plug in there for finding the exercise professional, you know, PT, whatever, somebody that knows MS. This would be the same for obviously your physician, your your counselor, your occupational therapist, you're not going to go to the best knee specialist for physical therapy in your city. You're going to need to find a PT, a trainer, an OT, whatever, who knows MS. They will know the nuances of the disease, the way the disease um, you know, ebbs and flows, and they can really help you much, much more so than somebody who does not know the disease. The last area that I do want to mention may cause areas of conflict would be safety. And Peggy mentioned this in um, her last slide of, you know, what is too much? How much is too much? Safety has to be the prime concern with activity and exercise for the person with MS and, again, those people surrounding them. Uh, you do not want to end up falling and, you know, fracturing an ankle or a wrist or something that, and I'm giving a worse, I'm giving some worst case scenarios here, but you do not want something to occur that will cause you a major setback of six or eight weeks of um, in a cast or pins and plates and surgery and then rehab. You want to be safe. And again, that's where the, um, the help of a, an appropriate healthcare professional uh, guiding your exercise or activity routine is going to be of major, major importance. Um, again, you know, things do happen. Uh, exercises happen. Or, I mean, I'm sorry. Accidents happen, you know, just tripping over a curb, walking into work. But if we can minimize the safety risks while you are working out, that's going to be paramount to, paramount to um, you know, keeping you going. Um, and with that, I will turn this over to um, Peggy with how are, you know, what are some strategies in dealing with anger, especially short-term anger? Well, I think there are actually a lot of things that people can do in the moment and when they feel angry, but I would emphasize that any of the things on this list I would encourage people to do on a regular basis, daily preferably, even if it's a very little bit of it, like Sue was just talking about doing regular exercise. I think when people do something calming on a regular basis, whether it's count to 10, take a few deep breaths, pray or meditate, do, doing something productive, and again, that could be just getting one thing done on your list, sometimes turning to something like that, um, can be helpful in reducing the anger in the moment. But it's also a little bit like, you know, in MS, the prob one of the problems is that people lose myelin on their nerves, right? So signals don't get conducted um, effectively. Well, I think this is kind of like myelin for your nerves, but this is your emotional nerves. So it's like cat 
cotton batting, it's protection. And so when you do these kinds of things on, on a regular basis, uh, when you read funny stories, when you watch funny shows, when you regularly talk to a friend who's supportive, um, I think that it actually can be protective in helping your angry not get out of control when it happens the next time. But any of these you can also do in the moment. I particularly like the idea of everyone having a personal pause button. So just as remote controls operate, um, VCRs, and I'm uh, aging myself here, but uh, TVs and all of that kind of thing, you can put yourself on pause and then you go and do one of these other things. It's also very useful to do something physical. And, Sue, I think you might have some ideas about how people can go about that doing something physical. Sure. Thanks, Peggy. Um, yes, I, I want to emphasize first and foremost, make sure before you start or continue with an activity program that you have medical clearance from your MD. And the supervision of, you know, I, I prefer a physical therapist. You know, we're licensed. This, this, is our, this is our area that we work with all day, every day. And again, somebody who knows MS is going to be very, very important. But it's extremely important to get medical clearance. Um, and what I also would like to say about exercise before moving on is that uh, I have had folks with MS who are patients of mine state that uh, they had been a total couch potato before the diagnosis of MS. And some folks have said that they never exercised a day in their life until they received the diagnosis of MS and that the MS aside, they are in the best physical condition of their life. They've lost weight. They've started a strengthening program. They've, um, th their cardiovascular fitness level is much better than it used to be. Then I've, I've had people literally who were former Olympians, and, of course, their uh, physical status is going to be somewhat compromised by their diagnosis, but they find ways that they are able to get their heart rate up, you know, sky high. They are able to stay as strong as possible. They are able to get as much satisfaction of what they do now as they used to be able to do then. Um, this program, the Can Do MS program, originated from a, a former Olympian named Jimmy Huga. It used to be called the Jimmy Huga Center. And Jimmy used to speak to staff and participants in the programs and say, he would say, quote, I cannot want your health for you any more than you need to want it for yourself. And that resonates with me when I'm working with folks with MS is that, you know, I can preach to you, I can be your cheerleader, I can give you examples, but you have to want to do this yourself. Certainly your support partners are going to be, you know, periphery, um, a periphery to your well-being and your success but this has to come from you and from within. So exercise can be and should be something that you know you want to do and you need to do. Exercise, as I mentioned already in the past, can have tremendous physiological and uh, psychological aspects that are, are just terrific, and it's been documented time and time again. Keep in mind, we as healthcare professionals professionals can modify what you need and want to do. Again, say you were a, a, a tremendous biker, you know, we can find things that you can still do. If you were a fantastic skier, we can still help you with that. Different organizations can help you with adaptive skiing. We can find many types of adaptive equipment for you. There's a, there are stationary bicycles that um, have arms and legs moving at the same time. They have a fan that can blow cool air on you. Um, uh, Peggy had mentioned relaxation before. Um, yoga is fantastic. I cannot sing the praises enough about the benefits, um, uh, psychological and physiological, for yoga and Tai Chi. Both of them can be done um, in compromised you know, uh, situations. 
only on the mat, only on the wheel, in, in a wheelchair or a chair. Um, same with Tai Chi. There are recumbent bicycles where you're seated lower and uh, your back is supported. Um, there's all sorts of weight machines in gyms. Uh, you can use free weights. You can use TheraBand, um, you know, resistive band. Um, believe me, if you find the right uh, healthcare professional or physical therapist, we can find something for you to do, be it at home, in a gym, uh, following videos, whatever. Um, as I mentioned before, exercise can be something that can be shared or it can be something to be done alone or preferably a mix of both. It can and should be done by everyone. So you support partners out there listening tonight, you know, hopefully you're listening to this for yourself as much as for your loved one. Um, exercise should be something that works for you. I like to tell folks, you know, it, whatever your routine, if it works for you, it works. You have to work it into your schedule. I personally believe this and I find that um, a lot of uh, uh, people have to live by this and I preach this. You have to make it a priority in your day. Even if you make it a priority in your day, a lot of days it's going to fall by the wayside. Um, I don't know if you're a morning person or not. I personally am. I find that if I do my activity in the morning, almost nothing gets in the way other than being a little tired sometimes. I find if I leave it for lunch or after work, so many days something gets in the way at work, uh, lunchtime, something gets in the way at work, um, or something gets in the way personally after work, but you have to make it a priority. And what I tell people a lot too is, you know, your, your, your work environment, they're not going to come and visit you in the hospital when you have an exacerbation or when you're, you know, diabetic or whatever. You have to make it a priority. So if it works for you, it works. And again, you know, finding the environment that you like the best. Um, I know one of the comments that we have received tonight is um, about Pilates, and I, I did fail to mention that regarding yoga, Tai Chi, and Pilates, which is it's also great for strengthening, stretching, flexibility, and even cardiovascular work. Um, exercise also should make you feel better. There are days you might feel a little bit worse during the activity, maybe a little bit worse after, but the overall benefits are far going to outweigh any negatives. And what I always like to tell people too with individual exercise programs is that and, um, when you do work out is that you should feel as good two hours after you exercise as you did before you exercised. If it has wiped you out and you've had to call off that day or lay on the couch for seven hours when you get home, probably you have overdone it or you may have some sort of infection or, you know, the beginning of an exacerbation. So, again, that goes back to listen to your body. And, again, exercise and activities should be fun. This, not, this should not be viewed as, you know, the worst part of your day or just, you know, a hellish existence that you're going to have to endure for the rest of your life. Not at all. There are so many things to do out there that can be enjoyable. So always, always keep that in mind. Um, with that, I want to segue back to Peg to talk about some risk factors that may be associated for, you know, in the, in the um, area of anger. Thanks, Sue. You know, I think that anything on this list is likely to be true for somebody out in our audience tonight. And if you have more than one of these risk factors, um, your chances of having regular feelings of anger goes up. When I look at things like stress and fatigue, I think of those, you remember a minute ago I was talking about how doing um, positive, effective coping strategies helps to build the emotional myelin. Well, things like stress and fatigue and trying to fit 36 hours of stuff into 24 is going to reduce the emotional myelin. Um, frustration, many sources, not just MS sources, but just life sources. They're there all the time. All of that thins that myelin. 
limited support. People need people to bounce things off mm -hmm. of. Somebody mentioned their pets in one of the questions um, sort of uh, sent in online tonight. So people need support um, to reduce their risk for um, chronic anger and I would say um, a destructive anger. And, you know, most of us take for granted that we all know how to communicate. But, in fact, lots and lots of people have ineffective communication skills. And there are lots of barriers uh, to communication. For example, in part related to the previous slides, you know, people feeling stressed and tired, there's no good time or place. And just as Sue was talking about um, making exercise a priority, people need to make talking and communicating with each other a priority. And that's often it's the end of the day and there just isn't any time or energy left. In many cases, it's hard to talk about something because people don't know much about it. This is really the case uh, when it comes to MS. Often people uh, with MS, it's hard to describe symptoms so that other people in your life understand them. Fatigue and other invisible symptoms are right up at the top of that list. Um, so sometimes you have to reach out and become educated. You don't have to do it all yourself. There are programs, and there's the National MS Society, there's the Can Do program, and you know, rely on the healthcare professionals who are helping you take care of your MS. Take people to visits with you, um, ask them to come to programs with you, that sort of thing, so that everybody has um, similar information. Sometimes people um, feel a barrier in communicating because they just are different. They cope differently, they communicate differently. You know, some people want to know everything, other people just don't want to know because it scares them. Some people are talkers, some people are the silent type. And in many cases, these people are in significant relationships together. Um, some people just want to talk to get things off their chest. Other people immediately want to resolve the problem. I worked with a couple recently at a can-do program, and this was exactly the issue where um, the husband with MS, when his wife would start to talk, and, then, and this is actually a very loving, wonderful couple, long time married, and she would start to talk, and he would immediately tell her where she was off the mark and what she needed to do to correct the situation. And he was able to say that now that he wasn't working, this is his way of contributing to the family and really didn't appreciate how absolutely annoying that was and why she then shut down. Um, mood and cognitive issues. When people are depressed, be it the partner, support partner, or the person with MS, um, those folks have more difficulty initiating conversations, maintaining them, wanting to be involved, that kind of thing. Also cognitive issues, if people are having trouble with losing their concentration, um, people need to be trying to communicate in a environment where you can control the amount of noise and people in and out and the dog barking and that kind of thing. You know, in communication, I use this slide because um, and, and just said timing is everything. So here's a woman sort of with a flashlight and her husband, her partner's uh, face saying, is this a good time to talk? And he's trying to go to bed. You know, he's trying to go to sleep because he's got work the next morning, and so does she probably. And I think that late at night, often people take to bed, and because it's dark and quiet, they think it's a great time to talk. And that's almost never the case. Mm -hmm. I would say probably when people are trapped in a car together is not necessarily the time either. So here's a perfect example of where sometimes people need to say to each other, when we want to talk about or ask the other person, when we want to talk about something that's important, what would be a good place for us to try to do that? Sometimes it means getting out of the house and going someplace and having a cup of something together where the kids and the dogs and the doorbell and, and the phones are not around. I just want to um, kind of quickly go through some tips for talking and some tips for listening. When you think about communication, it's not just what you say. It's just not what you communicate to the other person. It is also being a good listener. And I'll get to the tips for listening here in a second. So you have to make time for talking. It doesn't necessarily just kind of fit into your schedule automatically. You really need to take time. So sometimes people set up meetings. I've had couples where once a week, Saturday morning, 8 o'clock, 8 to 8.15, 8 to 8.30, they are talking. I remember working with a couple that had been married for 25 years. All the kids were out of the house, and they said, this feels kind of silly. 
And by about the second week, they were totally sold on it and said, this is the most talking that we've ever done and in years and haven't been angry with each other. People have to acknowledge their differences in coping and communication skills. We're not like each other, and, and to show respect for that, using I statements rather than you statements. When people start using you statements, it feels like that person is just poking you right in the chest um, and sort of finding fault with you. You want to give the other person time to think and respond when you're talking. So you, you sort of say, you know, even checking, am, am I going too fast? Is this too much information? Do, would you like me to slow down? Um, there are some definite dotes. You don't want to always, uh, overgeneralize. So the use of terms like always and never, and I find myself catching myself even in my own relationships, working hard not to use these terms because they just really don't often apply. Dripping with sarcasm, not a good thing when you're, when you're talking with people. And expecting the other person to read your mind, this comes up a lot in, in relationships where people feel that if you really cared about me, you could, and you've known me all these years, you would know what I wanted and how I feel. And I have to tell you, long time married myself, not the case. So you really need to tell people those things. Some tips for listening. Um, you want to listen actively and confirm what you've heard. And when I say actively, it helps to summarize and for the two of you to agree that that's what you're going to do with each other, that after the person talks, you indicate that you heard what they said and make sure that you understand. Pay attention to your own body language. So taking responsibility, you know, eye rolling again, not real high up on the list of ways to be a good listener, smirking, um, doing something else at the same time, sort of being on your phone, watching TV, that kind of thing. Um, some people use the word ouch, say the word ouch as a shorthand signal for when something has been said that feels hurtful to them when they're communicating. Um, some don'ts you don't want to interrupt, as I was talking about this couple that I worked with recently. Jumping to conclusions, if you're not sure what someone is feeling or thinking, ask. Or again, if you're not really understanding what they're saying to you, you're showing that you're being a good listener. And again, I put expect the other person to read your mind because I think that it works both ways, whether you're working on listening skills or um, skills. I added in some information here from Dr. John Gottesman, who's a very well-known uh, family marriage therapist. And we used some of his work in our um, National MS Society program on relationships. Uh, but he talks about ways to resolve conflicts peacefully, like softening the startup, expressing your concerns without criticizing or attacking, taking responsibility, as I just said, for your own behavior. Um, sometimes people will agree to a compromise plan, not necessarily a long-term solution, but something to implement and try out for a week or two and then come back and reevaluate. So most things that we decide are not... Um, in stone, they can be changed. Uh, learning ways to exit and repair disagreements to avoid escalation at all costs. Um, many couples, uh, families will agree to take a break and how they indicate to the other people that they need that break, but then also agree that you're going to come back to this later so that the issue doesn't sort of remain kind of simmering on the back burner because it will boil over again. Okay, so we have... Um, our last question for all of you, if you were Alice, remember our example with her husband and two children, um, if you were Alice would you and her husband, would you pursue individual counseling, couples counseling, family counseling, none of the above? And again, keep in mind that we're just talking about sort of now. Any of these are options uh, potentially for later. And it's interesting what we're seeing here. Like over 50% of people opting for family counseling. And, you know, I think it's really hard to go wrong here. I don't think there is a right or wrong answer. I always tell people um, if you're going to seek help, whoever is most motivated or wants to go, even if other people that you would like to go with you say, I don't want to go, go anyhow because it's more than likely going to have an impact on everybody, whether they physically um, are in the session or not. So that's interesting. So about a little less than a third of people would go couples, 
Um, but um, half of you would um, opt or encourage Alice to seek family therapy. Um, asking for help. I like this cartoon. Um, it, uh, here, we have to give this woman credit. She's gone for help. And I will say that this is kind of an out-of-date um, slide or, or way of doing therapy because really nobody lays on a couch anymore. Um, but she's saying to the therapist, she said, I'd like to learn how to be less critical. My mouth has been classified as a weapon of mass destruction. And I guess this is a funny slide, but also I think good for her. She's heard she has been a good listener. She has heard what people have said, and she is seeking help. So when someone wants to be more active physically, what can they do? What would you encourage them to do? Well, um, this slide pretty much summarizes things that I have mentioned. Number one, finding the correct healthcare professional to help you with where you are right now. And as I mentioned, sometimes someone with MS will become more active than they ever were. And do not always think that the course of the disease is always going to make you less active, less strong. I've had patients uh, who have gotten stronger with the MS because they are focusing on their body and working out. So this slide is just a summary of things that I have mentioned before. And let me also mention to look for programs in your area that are specific to classes with, or activities for folks with MS. National MS societies have really great yoga classes or um, pool exercises or you know this or that. So make sure you, find, you look for that in the community with, in which you live. Um, and then um, also uh, we want to discuss briefly on accessing mental health services that Peg can say a few words about. Thanks, Sue. You know, I, I said a minute ago that um, I really just encourage people to access services whenever they feel the need, but I think as soon as you want, especially though if anger is feeling overwhelming or unmanageable um, and it's just kind of overwhelming you and your family, your relationships, and it's um, negatively particularly affecting relationships. Also, if you find yourself um, engaging in unhealthy coping behaviors, that's an indication. Remember that it's sort of like your, your temperature's gone up and you need to pay attention to it. Um, probably if I had my preference, we would introduce mental health services to everybody at the point of diagnosis. It doesn't mean that just people with MS need them. And in fact, I think a lot of what Sue and I have talked about tonight can really be generalized, we know, to support partners and family members, but really the population at large. Um, people can um, access uh, professionals through the National MS Society. Um, they can help you locate people in your area. I do recommend to people if they can, uh, as Sue mentioned, if you can work with somebody who has experience with MS, that's great. I think for mental health, that's not often the case. Um, but if you can find someone through your insurance, through the National MS Society, um, or through your state associations, um, state psychological association, people will designate themselves as people who have experience working with chronic health problems. And so they're more likely to be a good match for you. But I, I'm not going to go through what a professional can help you do, but I think there are many issues that a professional could sort of help you with, make you more aware of, and help you generate options so that you don't feel so stuck with your problems. There is nothing worse than feeling sort of backed into a corner with how you and your partner uh, feel or your, where your relationships are and not knowing how to work your way out. You don't have to do it alone and do it with assistance. And I think we're going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Peggy and Sue. And Peggy, I do have to agree with you. I think that this topic is, um, you know, is useful for for the audience at large. And and I know that I've gotten a lot of good tips on just how I can communicate um, my anger and frustrations and my viewpoint to the people around me. So thanks for all those great tips. 
Um, I, I see that we're running a little short on time, but we have received quite a few questions. I want to remind everyone that this program, it is being recorded and it is going to be archived on our website tomorrow. Um, so if you need to log off the webinar, um, please check our website tomorrow um, if you want to see the end of, you know, if you want to uh, listen to the Q&A portion. Um, but I want to make sure that we address some of these questions so we may go over um, our time a bit. So we received a lot of questions um, from the support partners' perspective, um, and um, we received quite a few questions during the registration process and also on this webinar. And so Peggy, I was hoping you could help address this. This person's question is, what is the best way for the spouse or the support partner to handle the anger when it is directed at them? Uh, well, and that's a really obviously uncomfortable position to be in. It, it, it hurts. It, it hurts physically. It hurts emotionally. I think that it's important. This is where the communication comes in, I think, and, you know, to provide feedback, not in the heat of the moment, not when the person's kind of, uh, letting you have it, but later on when things have calmed down for the uh, support partner to go to the person with MS and talk about what that was like for them and give them respectful, gentle feedback and that they want to and, and express their motivation that they want to work on things being better. Um, I do think that... Um, so we've, we've talked a lot about mood issues tonight, too, I think, in addition to the anger, and that it is, it is important, and this goes for both support partners and the person with MS, that when people are having these kinds of difficulties with their mood, it is, it's at least worth thinking about the possibility of depression either being there and not diagnosed and not treated or being inadequately treated. But I think the importance of providing feedback and letting the person know calmly um, what that was like is a start. Um, and then, uh, Sue, we had a question um, from someone who is asking how, you know, when they should go see a physical therapist versus, you know, going to the gym and um, how often you would recommend they would need to see a physical therapist? I know that's kind of hard to answer without knowing their specifics, but maybe if you could kind of touch on that, when they should go see a physical therapist and, and usually in the beginning how often they should see them. Sure. Um, certainly I think somebody should see a physical therapist immediately upon diagnosis so that the physical therapist and the patient with BMS can have a baseline of, you know, where they are when they are first diagnosed, even if it is during or when they're coming out of an exacerbation. The physical therapist is going to be the one to be able to identify literally strengths and weaknesses, muscle strengths, muscle weaknesses, um, uh, problems with balance, with flexibility, the need for proper assistive devices or um, bracing, you know, anything like that. I, I would recommend that they see a physical therapist for, you know, a little while. That might be two weeks, that might be seven or eight weeks, depending on how well they're doing, how much help they do need. And then I would also strongly suggest a return to a physical therapist when there's any change in their status. And don't always think that, oh, when I get worse, I guess I should see a physical therapist. Like I said before, some people find that they're getting stronger and that their program that the physical therapist gave them is too easy these days. They're doing very well. They need to go back to the physical therapist, you know, to, to beef up their program. Or like I said, you know, they may need a change in an assistive device, a brace, you know, any change in status should warrant a return to the PT, physician, et cetera. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for your uh, Let's see here. So we have another question, um, and we actually had quite a few questions um, about this in, in regards to invisible symptoms and how to communicate what that means to the person who isn't experiencing it. So um, the question is, how do you describe fatigue to someone who's never experienced it or someone who can't see that I'm actually experiencing fatigue? 
Um, this is Sue. I, I will mention a few words and then Peggy too probably. Um, you know, it's, it, it, there's a word for it in the MS world, lassitude, which is defined as overwhelming fatigue. Um, I, you know, I, I think that even people without MS have experienced overwhelming fatigue, be it anything cyclical, anything that is related to lack of sleep, travel, et cetera, you know, I I would think describing it as your worst day of your worst fatigue, but it hits me as a person with MS every day of my life from 4 to 7 o'clock. Or, you know, there are days that I have it from the moment I wake up till the moment I go to bed, and it may last three or five days or two weeks. Um, you know, that would just be a suggestion from a non-MS person of what it may feel like. Yeah, I, I agree with Sue. I think giving examples um, and of literally examples that come up during the day that remind the person that fatigue is different. And this is neurologic fatigue that people with MS have. This is not from getting a bad night's sleep or this is not from overdoing. Um, people with MS can get this fatigue no matter how well they take care of themselves or how well they sleep. All of those things make a difference and can make it worse. But I also think there's really wonderful written materials from the National MS Society about fatigue and helping people understand and appreciate invisible symptoms. I think also it's okay to say to people, you know, sometimes it feels like you leave me or you know, or what you know, or that's really hard for me when you question me. And I think to say to that person, you know, what's that really about? Um, you know, why do you question that? And sometimes when I've questioned family members, what I hear is, I guess I don't want to think that it's that bad. It scares me about what might be coming down the line. Mm-hmm. So this is an example of where fear and anxiety can often be behind these sort of. Uh, confrontational comments and questions that people. Right, and may I also add regarding fatigue, this is not couch potato fatigue where, you know, if someone is just going to think, oh, you are lazy, come on, you know, just get up and do it, just do it. That's not it at all. Like Peggy said, it, this is a neurological symptom of MS. For that clarification, um, and we'll just take one last question. I apologize to those that, the questions that we weren't able to get to, but um, Peggy, I was hoping you could help answer this. Um, this person has a family member um, who does not understand well, you know, their symptoms of MS, and 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 when they try to talk about their issues, it often causes conflict. And she's wondering, when is it a good time um, to bring in a counselor or to talk with a professional? When when is it a good uh, when is it a good time for anybody, I guess, who are having issues to, mm-hmm. to turn to a counselor to talk about these problems? You know what? I think it's actually never too early. And like I said, I, I think that I would love if we could introduce sort of counseling from the get-go. Um, I used to see a lot of newly diagnosed people sort of before some of this all occurred and things kind of went off track. And um, it was very useful because then, you know, people could come back if if problems recurred. So I think to sort of introduce the idea that, you know, this is a difficult condition to have and that people um, may have a lot of questions about it and people may disagree and there's going to be conflict about it and a lot of the symptoms are hard to understand. And I think um, I have found some of the most valuable sessions been when somebody I was seeing bring in a spouse um, I remember somebody, um, I was seeing a woman, and she brought in her husband, and she brought in her two adult children because fatigue was her primary symptom. You would never would have picked her out in a crowd as having MS. And she had had MS for 15 years, and they still didn't get it and were still kind of loading her up with stuff, and she did have some issues saying no, which she and I were working on. But it was amazing because her family afterwards said, I guess we never really understood it before. I only ever met with them as a family once. So sometimes it doesn't take a lot of interaction. But I think use healthcare professionals 
let them be the heavy, let them be the explainer, because otherwise I think you as the person with MS feel kind of like you're in the middle all the time, and that just creates extra stress. So I don't think it's ever too early. Again, kind of getting a baseline, you know, as soon as you're diagnosed, see the PT, see the, the psychologist, get a baseline pulse on where you are, you know, at that point in time. Um, so I think that's all the qu time we have for questions. Again, I apologize um, for those whose questions we were, were not able to address. But um, you can ask your questions um, on our uh, website. On your screen here, you'll see some other resources that Can Do MS has to offer. Um, and we have what's called our Q&A um, page. It's, it's our Ask the Can Do team. If you have a burning question or if you just need an answer about um, from one of our programs consultants about anything, um, please visit our website, look for the Ask the Can Do team page, submit your question, and we'll have one of our programs consultants answer that question for you. Um, again, also we also have our e-news uh, email that's sent out monthly to all of our program participants, um, and it just talks about upcoming programs and information. And we also have our Can Do Library, and that is a resource of all of our library articles written on different topics that are all written by our program consultants. So again, please uh, remember to visit our website at mscando.org. Before I share our topic for our next month's webinar, I'd like to introduce you to I Conquer MS. I Conquer MS is a new way to fight MS, and it empowers people with MS to contribute their health data and their ideas for research. Um, the information that you provide um, will um, enable new and more effective treatments to be developed. So if you're interested in participating, it's free of charge. Um, just go to www.iconquerms.org, register as a member, and you can contribute your information and ideas. So our next webinar um, will be on August 11th. It's at the same uh, time, same place, um, the second Tuesday of the month from 8 p.m. to 9, 15 p.m. Eastern Time. The topic is Taking Charge of Your MS Transitions, a Solution-Focused Approach. Um, and it will be presented by psychologist Dr. David Rentel and uh, physical therapist Mandy Rohrig. So please join us from the convenience of your home or office at Norcharge. Um, and again, thank you so much to Sue and Peggy, our presenters, for all of your insightful information. We um, you know, appreciate all of your, your knowledge and, and tips and tools that you provided for us this, this evening. Um, I hope everyone has a great evening tonight, and thank you for joining us. Our pleasure. Thank you.